Hello and welcome to module 1 on deep learning. In this video, we will know what is deep learning, where it is used, why is it booming right now, what is the neural network and what is the motivation behind it. So let's dive right into it. What is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is again a subset of artificial intelligence. Intelligence can be said to be human-like behavior and in AI, the machine tries to mimic human behavior. Machine learning enables a machine to recognize a pattern or learn anything without being explicitly programmed for it. In deep learning, we use a neural network to learn these patterns. Deep learning is used in our day-to-day -day lives. Face unlock features in our smartphones is done by facial recognition, which is aided by deep learning. Recommendations about products, movies, on websites like Amazon and Netflix use deep learning. Voice assistants like Siri, Google Assistant and Alexa use deep learning to parse our voice commands. Deep learning in medical imaging has a lot of scope and it is one of the hottest topics. Drug discovery is also aided by power of deep learning. Apps and chatbots use deep learning for customer support. Then there are these self-driving cars which exploit computer vision to detect objects in real time enabling the computer to make decisions. Here is an example where we use deep learning to predict what digit is drawn in a figure. This is a subset of MNIST handwritten digits dataset. We don't hard code a program because every time a digit is drawn, it is different from the others in some way. But deep learning focuses on pattern rather than exact features. The fact that each digit is different from one another every time it is drawn is clear from the image. A neural network is motivated from human brain's neuron. Each neuron receives a signal, processes it, and then passes a signal to the next neuron. Note that human brain is much more complex than this. We just mimic the signal processing part. This is how a neural network looks like. It has an input layer, hidden layer, and an output layer. The features from the dataset are fed into the input layer, and after a few calculations in the hidden layer, the output is generated. Consider this example, where you need to predict the price of house by just using the size of the house in the square feet. The best fitting curve can be seen here. A neuron can learn the impact of a feature over the label along with some bias. As you can see, a neuron takes input the size of the house after doing some calculations that is multiplying it by some weight and then adding some bias, it gets the price. This best fitting curve that you see here looks like a ReLU function. ReLU stands for Renal Electrified Unit. It is an activation function that we use in deep learning. We will learn more about activation functions in the further videos. For multiple features, layers of neuron can combine features along with certain weights to create new useful features, which are then fed for further processing. For example, more the size of the house and more the number of the bedrooms means higher the price. This allows neural networks to generate strong correlation between features and labels. Please note that these input features are provided to all of these neurons. These neurons learn the weight accordingly. For example, Size of the house has nothing to do with walkability. So, when this size feature is fed to the neuron that computes walkability, the weight is very small and hence the size has no impact on walkability. This is inside of a neural network. Inside of a neuron, what we do is we multiply the features with certain weights and then add some bias to it. After that, some activation function is applied to it and fed forward to the next neuron. This is called forward propagation. Don't worry about the calculations, we'll discuss them soon. In the next video, we will know about datasets. But if you already know about datasets, you can skip the next video. Thank you for watching. Hello. In this video, we will talk about datasets. This is an optional video, and if you know already about datasets, you may skip this one. There are, let's talk about terminologies in dataset. Firstly, the, 
for our supervised learning, we need two things in our data set. Firstly, the features and secondly, the labels. The features are the properties of our examples that will help us predict something. So, for example, if we have the number of rooms, the zip code, age of the house, locality, size of the house and so on, then we will be able to produce something like the label in which will be for this example, price of the house. Now, if we have the date of transaction, location, amount, and um, whether uh, the IP address may be, then we can predict if our given transaction is fraudulent or not. Width of the tumor, graininess, increase size in the past month, and so on, uh, such features will help us to predict whether a given tumor is benign or malignant. So these are the things that we need for a supervised learning. Now the data set, now the learning can be of four types, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement and semi-supervised. When we are talking about supervised learning, we already have, we already know what do we want to predict. In case of unsupervised learning, we don't know what we are about to predict. For example, if, uh, for example, if information about a lot of customers is provided, then you may not know which customer belong to which group, but when use an unsupervised algorithm, you will get to know the customers are segmented in different groups. This basically, this kind of works like similarity. Talking about reinforcement algorithm, the, comp the machine or the program learns while it is running. So in reinforcement learning, there is concept of reward and punishment. So if our reinforce, if, so if our program achieves our desired output, we reward it with something. And if it does not, we punish it. Anyhow, in semi-supervised learning, only a few labels are given and a few labels are not. Now the types of classification, um, now the types of problems that we solve using data sets and machine learning and deep learning is classification problem, prediction problem, clustering and other lot of other problems as well. So there is this question, how much data is enough? More the data, the better it is, but uh, it won't make sense if uh, you have a lot of data and you're not using it properly. So. It is good if you, so if you have a lot of data, it is always good to use cross validation and uh, train test dev split. What data is good? So it depends on the problem, but in general, a data set is go good. If it has uh, less outliers, there is no class imbalance in case of classification problems, less number of missing values in the features, all features. All useful features are present. For example, if I were to predict the weather and I don't know, let's say the year or maybe the month, then it is quite, you know, a nuisance for the programmer to see if they can predict, to see if they can predict the weather or not. Also, the features should be in useful format. Anyhow, all these all these drawbacks can be managed uh, except the useful features, uh, presence of useful features. All the rest can be managed or, um, you know, countered with uh, many deep learning, many feature engineering algorithms. Now, where do we find good data sets? First of all, the internet is full of data. You can go to Kaggle, Amazon data sets, UCI, machine learning repositories. Google dataset search engine and Lionbridge datasets. These are all, most of the dataset uh, present on the internet is free. In the next video, we'll be talking about binary classification and logistic regression. I will see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will see what a binary classification problem is. Consider a problem where you need to predict if a tumor is malignant or not. To visualize this, we use only one variable, the tumor size. 
it is quite clear from this visualization that the margin will be a linear one. So if a point falls somewhere over here, it's a benign tumor and if somewhere here, then it's malignant. If a new example comes, then the margin shifts. This new example might be an outlier. What is hypothesis? Hypothesis is a function when provided with right weights produces desired output. Instead of representing weights for each feature separately, we use vectors. And we multiply these vectors with the features to get our hypothesis like theta naught plus theta 1x1 and so on. Here theta 0 is our bias and theta 1 to theta n are our weights. In general, we write h theta x is equal to theta transpose x. But this will produce us a continuous value. But what if our output is non-continuous and discrete, like a class? Then we write our hypothesis as h theta x equals g theta transpose x. Here, g is a sigmoid function or a softmax function. A sigmoid function takes any real number and has a range from 0 to 1. A softmax function is pretty much similar to a sigmoid function, except it is used for more than two classes. You can say a softmax function for two classes is a sigmoid function. Here is how a sigmoid function looks like. If the value of z is very high, then the value of e to the power minus z is very low and hence 1 plus something very low is 1 and therefore the value of f of z remains close to 1. If the value of z is very low, then e to the power minus z will be a very large number. And hence, 1 plus e to the power minus z will also be a very large number. 1 upon a very large number will result to a very small number. And hence, the value of f of z will be very small. As we have seen before, the decision boundary we drew for the tumor prediction was linear. But, but that's not always the case. Sometimes, the decision boundary can be nonlinear as well, as you can see here. In such cases, in such cases, the hypothesis is polynomial, but we don't have to worry about it as neural networks are very good at learning nonlinear boundaries as well. So, the question is, how is theta calculated? Theta is calculated using optimization algorithms. Gradient descent is one of the most commonly used ones and is a basic optimization algorithm. It changes theta based on the difference between the hypothesis and the actual label, that is, the error. Theta is initialized randomly at the beginning, so the error may be very high. But as the algorithm proceeds, the value of theta changes and hence the error is reduced. If the hypothesis is given by s theta xi and the actual label is given by yi, then the error can be given as this. But what does this mean? Let me explain you. Consider a binary classification problem, then the label can either be 0 or 1. Our prediction can also be 0 or 1, so there are a total of 4 combinations. In this case, this, terms, this term becomes 0, this term is 1, and this term becomes 0, and hence the error is 0. The first term calculates the error if our yi is 1, and the second term calculates the value if our yi is 0. So, for all m examples in our data set, we take the mean of that error. So, our aim is to minimize this error j of theta. To do so, we change theta by performing gradient descent. We perform this task over minimizing error many times. Once the weights are set, we get very close to the result. But first, we need to calculate the hypothesis, right, for like for the first time. For that, we use forward propagation. In our next video, we will learn about that. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will talk about forward propagation and the maths behind it. For a very deep neural network, we will use these notations. Capital L is the total number of layers in your network. N superscript L will be the number of neurons in layer L. A superscript L will be the activation of the layer L and capital W superscript L will be the weights for ZL. Suppose we have one training example XY. X is a vector of n features. Then we will have 
one bias as well. So this is an, an a vector of n plus one feature, whereas y is just a real number. One forward pass through the network includes calculation of ZL equals WL minus one transpose into AL minus one. One forward pass through the neural network includes calculation of these following. ZL equals WL minus one transpose into AL minus one. This here is a vector multiplication. So the shape of W and A should be compatible for these multiplication. After we have computed ZL, we pass it through an activation function to calculate the activation of that layer. The activation for the layer zero will be the input vector. Please note that here this capital letter X denotes a vector of shape M cross N plus one, where M is the number of example. We use vector representation because this allows us to reduce explicit for loops in our program. Here is an example of a deep neural network. This is an input layer. Here these three are the hidden layer and this is our output layer. Now let's perform some calculation and see how the algorithm works. For this specific neural network, this is the input layer and these are the hidden layer and this is the output layer. Since the output is only a single neuron, we can say that this was for a binary classification problem or a re regression problem. For our example, we will take it as a binary cl classification problem and use the sigmoid activation function for this layer. For a single training example, as mentioned earlier, A0 will be equal to the feature vector X. Now, for the next layer, we need to compute Z1 first. And Z1 equals weight of that layer. vector multiplication with x that is the activation of previous layer and then we need to calculate 8 1 for the next layer that is activation of the first layer to be some activation function that would be a redo function or a leaky redo function with weight 1 transpose x or you can write this as g of z1. For the third layer, z2 equals weight of that second layer vector multiplication with activation of the previous layer, which is a1. And then we compute the activation for the second layer, which will be equal to G of Z2. Then we need to compute Z then we need to compute z3 that is the weights of the third layer vector multiplication with activation of the previous layer and then we compute the activation for the third layer here the activation of the third layer is fed directly to the output hence we use sigmoid function to compute this. And this A3 is our output that is y hat.
since we are performing vector multiplication we need to get our dimensions correct so here is something that will help you to figure it out weights of the lth layer will have the dimension of number of neurons in the lth layer comma number of neurons in the l minus 1 layer that is the previous layer and for the bias term bl this will be equal to n l comma 1 now these two are included in same matrix so to implement this what we generally do is we implement them uh, in this way this will be of size nl this wise and this will be of n l minus 1 and hence you will get the dimensions for wl right and for the bias we mention it like this so what can be done is they can be concatenated and this can be written over here so that the dimension will be nl minus 1 plus 1 let's see how these vector multiplications are performed let's say we have a single example then the input feature vector x will be have n features so its shape will be n cross 1 so the number of neurons in the input layer will be n now for the shape of w1 that is the weights of the first layer will be equal to the number of neurons in the current layer that is 5 comma the number of neurons in the previous layer that is n in this way we avoid these transformation operations this w transpose x operations and then we can get w1 dot product with x plus and the shape of b will be equal to the number of neurons in the current layer 5 comma 1 plus b this will be of 5 comma n into n plus 5 comma 1 and hence this will be equal to 5 comma 1 plus 5 comma 1 and we will have weights we will have z of 5 comma 1 this is the shape of z1 similarly for z2 uh, the activation functions do not change the shape uh, so the shape of the activation a1 will be 5 comma 1 same as that of z1 now for z2 weights the shape will be the shape of the weights for the second layer will be number of neurons in the current layer that is 5 comma number of neurons in the previous layer 5 into activation from the previous layer that is of shape 5 comma 1 plus the bias term that will be again number of neurons in the current layer comma 1 and we get 5 comma 1 again for the activation of the second layer it will be equal to 5 comma 1 that is the shape of z1 z2 sorry that is the shape of z2 then for z3 it will be the same 
five comma five into five comma one plus five comma one and we get five comma one vector which then passes through the activation a three will also be of shape five comma one now we needed the dimension of the output to be as a, of a single unit that is either of one cross one or just as a real number so we perform another pass that is we calculate z4 that is for the output layer that will be equal to that will be equal to the weights of the fourth layer and the shape will be of number of neurons in the current layer here we have one comma number of neurons in the previous layer that is five into the activation from the previous layer and its shape was five into one and then we add the bias of shape one comma one and then one cross one and then we give the output as a5 i'm sorry a4 equals sigmoid z4 and this will be of shape 1 so this will give us a class either 0 or 1 here it will not be a sigmoid function instead it can be any function and this is not equal to y cap instead this is equal to y cap because this is of the shape 5 comma 1 and uh, that's not what we want this was for a single training example now if we had this for m training examples then the shape of the initial feature vector would be of n comma m and hence here instead of this one we would get m and the shape of z1 would be 5 comma m instead of 5 comma 1 so goes for this activation function as well activation for the first layer would be of size 5 comma m here too this will be of 5 comma m And instead of 1 here it will be 5 m so goes for here 5 comma m here as well Same goes for the fourth layer as well. <clears throat> now, instead of getting an output of 1, 1, we will get an output of 1, m. So goes for the activation and the shape of the y hat will be 1, m. That is prediction for all training examples. You must be wondering, how. what about this? These shapes are incompatible. Well, in Python, there is something called broadcasting, which deals with this case. What happens is you give a vector of shape 5, comma m, and you add something to it of shape 5, comma 1. Then this operation is done over all these 5, comma 1 m 5, comma 1 vectors means this will be added to this, this will be added to this, this will be added to this, and this will be added to this for the all m columns. We have now performed a single forward pass and calculate our first prediction with the initial the random weights. Now, we need to change these weights using gradient descent. And this is the cost function that we need to minimize. Here, k is the number of classes. If the number of classes is 
2 we have a binary classification problem in the next video we'll talk about activation functions how they are implemented and what are the common ones thank you for watching hello and welcome in this video we will talk about activation functions what do they do and why do we need them we will also see what are different types of activation functions to understand why we need activations let's take a look at this example the best fit line for a linear regression problem is a straight line and for a linear classification we need a linear decision boundary so for these margins and best fit lines we need a linear function to express them but what is a linear function a linear function from the real numbers to the real numbers is a function whose graph is a line in the plane generally they are of the form y is equal to mx plus c where m is the slope and c is the y-intercept this looks like what we write as wx plus b where w is the weights x is the input and b is the bias Therefore, our hypothesis theta transpose x is a linear hypothesis and can only be used for linear data. It won't work well on nonlinear data. The characteristic property of linear functions is that when the input variable is changed, the change in the output is proportional to the change in the input. Suppose we have the linear function y equals mx plus c. And we want to see how the how does y change with respect to x then we differentiate y with respect to x so we get m into dx by dx plus dc by dx this turns out to be zero because c is a constant and this is equal to 1. Therefore, we get the change in y with respect to x is equal to m, which is a constant, which means y is directly proportional to x. Consider the ZOR function. The ZOR function, exclusive OR, is an operation on two binary values, x1 and x2. When exactly one of these binary values is equal to 1, the ZOR function returns 1 otherwise it returns 0. So if we want to draw a linear margin, we won't get the correct output. Only if we had a non-linear decision boundary, we could separate the ones from zeros. Activation functions introduce non-linearity. To solve our XOR problem, we will use ReLU function. ReLU function performs a max operation over 0 and input that is it returns 0 if the value is less than 0 else it returns the same value with relu applied to our hypothesis it would look something like this the knee of our function will not be at 0 instead it will be at b this distance over here is b the bias here I have a pre-trained neural network with the ReLU activation. This network was trained over the ZOR operation. Here, this is the weight for the first layer, weight for the second layer, bias for the first layer, and bias for the second layer. X here is our input. This is the combination of, this is the possible combinations of zeros and ones. And X or X is this, this is our correct label. Now, when we compute now, when we perform a single forward pass to the first layer, we get this as our Z. Let me just write how the forward pass was performed. Z equals W X plus B and then A equals G of Z. So here we have our Z. This part over here is Z. 
this g is our relu function and we get activation as this for the second layer we perform the same operation and when this is multiplied with this then and an activation of zor is performed this is the output we get which is same as this therefore activation solve problems which are non linear as well and to think about it in real life values are almost always non linear as said earlier activation functions introduce non linearity to our hypothesis look at these calculations here no matter how many layers of neurons you add without an activation function it will be a linear hypothesis this here is an example from the deep learning book by ian goodfellow this it illustrates what happens if we don't use activation functions so the take away of this video is a neural network without an activation function is essentially just a linear model the activation function does the linear the activation function does the non linear transformation to the input making it capable of learning and perform more complex tasks a neural network without an activation function is essentially just a linear model the activation function does the non linear transformation to the input making it capable to learn and perform more complex tasks here we see the predictions made by a network with activations and one without activation this one is more accurate than this one here are some activation functions that we use this is a step function a step function returns zero if the value is less than threshold else it returns the value if we keep the threshold equal to zero this will act like a relu function step functions are very useful in image processing as they are helpful when we need to convert an image from rgb to grayscale or a threshold value is to be applied over an image then we have this linear function basically this function does not in introduce any non linearity so we this function is not used anymore if we wanted to learn a linear curve then the linear functions were used the, here we have the softmax function as explained earlier this is used for binary classification problems and here we have a tanh or a hyperbolic function either of them can be used then we have leaky relu so instead of just returning the negative values leaky relu returns a smaller value close to 0 but not 0 swish function is a relatively new function here we uh, it is modified sigmoid function the parameter beta is used to create this knee bend over here so if the value is very close to 0 if the input is close to 0 and the value is negative we get a negative value instead of getting zero but we haven't trained a neural network yet we only saw how to perform a forward pass and how the activation functions work in the next video we will talk about back propagation thank you for watching hello and welcome in the previous videos we discussed the architecture of a neural network how a forward pass is performed on a neural network and what are activations we also discussed why we need those activation functions in this video we will discuss about the magic behind back propagation algorithm back propagation was proposed in 1970 and is still just working fine to refresh the forward pass consider this network for each layer we used to calculate z and then apply the activation to it we do this till we reach the output layer please note that in this given example we have four units in the output layer this means we predict four classes so the intuition behind back propagation algorithm 
is that we can calculate a small change or error in every node. So we calculate the small change in the cos function j theta due to the small change in theta of the jth node in the lth layer and it is denoted by delta superscript l subscript ij. Suppose there are m training examples then for each layer from l then for each layer l from 1 to capital L we compute the derivative we compute these derivatives we start from the last layer and traverse to the first hidden layer we do so to apply the chain rule of calculus and find derivatives easily for simplicity let's assume that we have only one training example for the fourth layer or the output layer it is very straightforward to calculate the derivative we calculate dj by d theta 4j or delta 4j by simply taking the derivative of the cos function. For a single training example, the cos function would look something like this j theta equals y y into log of h theta x but instead of h theta x we can write a4 that is activation of the fourth layer which is our output layer minus 1 minus y log of 1 minus a activation of the fourth layer. Now, if we differentiate this with respect to a, we can calculate the derivative d j theta by d a l that is the fourth for the fourth layer as y upon the derivative of log a log x is 1 by x. So, this will be a or minus 1 minus y which is again a constant upon 1 minus a to the power 4. We also had a minus outside the cost so this will be minus over here and this Will produce another minus over here. And we will get one minus y upon one minus a four minus y upon a four. The j represent, represents the jth neuron, but if we take these neurons as in a single vector, then we can represent them in vectors. Since vectorization helps in removing explicit for loops, we will use vectorized implementations. Now, hence we have calculated del loss function upon del al. Now applying the chain rule of the calculus, we will get this, this formula. If you want for clear explanation, you can apply the chain rule yourself. g is the derivative of our activation function. Our g is a ReLU function. So g of x is equal to x if x is greater than 0 and 0 if x is less than 0. 
ReLU functions are not continuous, but yet we still use them in gradient descent. So if we want to calculate g prime of x, we will have to differentiate them separately. So we will get 1 if x is greater than 0 and 0 if x is less than 0. This is for ReLU function. We also use sigmoid functions. So for that, we write sigma We write sigmoid of x equals one upon one plus e to the power minus x. If we differentiate this with respect to x, we get minus 1 into 1 plus e to the power minus x to the power minus 2 into dy dx of 1 plus e to the power minus x. Again, if we solve the last term, we get 1 plus e to the power minus x to the power minus 2 into 1 is a constant, so we'll get this as 0, 0 plus e to the power minus x. So derivative of e to the power x is e to the power x, but since here we have minus x, minus sign will come out into minus 1 into e to the power minus x. This will look like e to the power minus x upon 1 plus e to the power minus x square. This is the derivative. But if we simplify this further, we can write it as e to the power minus x plus 1 minus 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus x whole squared. If we separate 1, 1 upon e to the power minus x and multiply it with 1 plus e to the power minus x minus 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus x. This again can be written as 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus x into 1 plus e to the power minus x upon 1 plus e to the power minus x minus 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus x. This and this gets cancelled and we get 1. This and this is basically the sigmoid functions, sigmoid function we took. So this is sigma, sigmoid of x into 1 minus sigmoid of x. So sigma prime of x and therefore sigma prime of x is this. So we, in this way we can find uh, derivatives of each and every sigmoid function. In this way, we can calculate this g dash z3 part. And this theta theta 3 transpose is the weight of the third layer, and delta 4 is calculated from the previous layer.
from the previous layer or you can say the beginning layer since we are moving backward. There will be no delta 0 as 0th layer is the input layer and there are no errors in the input layer. Now for a training set x of m examples, we set all the thetas, all the derivatives to 0 at first. Please note that this is a vector representation again. Now the question arises, why do we need gradients? Gradient re represent small change in a value due to a small change in other value. If two values are independent, the gradient is zero. We compute change in our cost or error with respect to the change in weight. Then we make changes to the weights and biases accordingly. If the change is zero, then the weight or the bias is not affecting our error. This also means that we have reached a point of local minima. Still, why do we need gradient descent? There are a lot of numerical methods that can interpolate on a given input like Newton's method. But remember, these methods are much more com computationally expensive than gradient descent. And we do not have that computational power for the large data that we feed to our neural networks. How do we implement calculus in Python? As we have seen, we know the activation functions how are they implemented? So we calculate the derivative, define a function of the derivatives and we provide them the numerical value. We don't need to worry about these when we are using frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Let's talk about the chain rule of calculus. Suppose there is a function f of x which is dependent over x. Then f dash x is equal to d by dx f of x. But what if I want to calculate of the derivative of f of x with respect to z which is also in some way dependent on x let's say z is equal to g of x and I want to calculate d by dz f of x. The chain rule helps us here. What it says is that d by dx f of x can be written as d by d f of x upon dz into dz upon dx. Now since we know, now as we want to calculate this and we know the dependency of f of x on x and we also know that z is also a function of x we can write this as f dash x equals d f of x upon dz into g of x. Now this can be made the subject of the formula by sending g over here and we get d f of x upon dz equals f dash x upon g dash x. This is how the chain rule works. In our case, we have j theta that is in some way dependent on x or r theta and we want to calculate dw which is essentially equal to d j theta upon dw. Now, since we can calculate d j theta upon d a l or the fourth layer, we can write this 
as dj theta upon d a 4 into d a 4 upon d w now again a4 is equal to activation we can use relu or sigmoid whatever may be the case but for us over here we have softmax but uh, let's not go to that right now g of w transpose we can ignore the transpose since we are just going to perform a derivative operation into x plus some constant b then we can perform now we since we will know what function we have applied we can calculate g dash of w x which will give us this this will be replaced by g dash w x plus b and this will be d a 4 the d so d w equals d a 4 into into g dash of w x plus b now we have calculated our derivatives but we still don't know how to update the weights and the biases we will talk about them in the next video that is gradient descent thank you for watching hello and welcome back in the previous videos, we talked about backpropagation. We saw how to compute gradients and the intuition behind backpropagation. We also saw working of chain rule and computed derivatives of activation functions. We computed gradients and now we want to update our weights. So, in this lecture, we will talk about gradient descent. To remind you what forward pass looks like, here is the slide from the previous videos. Please pause the video and take a look at this to revise the concepts. Here is the slide for the backward pass to remind you what backward, backward pass looked like. Please pause the video to, remind, to revise the concepts. This is how we computed our, our gradients. Now we have computed our gradients and we are about to update our weights and our biases. All the gradients that we are about to compute are set to zero initially and then we perform backward pass and then they are updated. But for the case of weights, we initialize them randomly. This is how we update our parameters. We repeat the process of updating theta simultaneously as theta minus alpha times the gradient with respect alpha times del j theta j upon del theta j now let's say theta 1 is our weight and we perform gradient descent on it now we can clearly see that the value of j theta that is our cost function decreases as we proceed the alpha term mentioned over here is the learning rate to choose the right alpha, we need to understand what alpha is doing here. Alpha is the rate by which you will descend down the, down the slope of j theta. If you choose a very small theta, you will learn very slowly. And so then do we choose a la very large alpha? Well, no. Large alpha can overshoot and thereby not reach the minima. Instead, it jumps here and there. 
Let's visualize this on our curve. Let's say our alpha is very small, somewhat close to 0, 0 0.0001. And now if we move down the slope, this is our theta 1 and this is our j theta. And this is our optimal point where the value of theta 1 results in smaller value of j theta. So if we move down the slope very slowly, small baby steps I reached here. After another step, I reached here, then after another step, I reached here, then after another step, I reached here, and so on. It will take me a lot of time to reach over here, and hence the number of iterations or the number of gradient descent I need to perform will increase, thereby slowing our algorithm. But what if alpha is very big, say alpha is equals to 1, then, or 10, then, this is our theta 1 and this is our j of theta. Then from let's say we start from here and then we directly jump to here and then we jump to here and then we jump here and then we jump here. Instead of going over here, we jump over here directly because this is equal to 10. It's because this is the this is the learning rate we kept and then it will over and then again time if it will try to decrease it will come over here and then again it can come over here and then again it can come over here somewhere so if we choose a very large alpha it will overshoot and hence we may not solve our problem correctly the commonly used value of alpha is depending on the depends on the algorithm of the optimization we use for a normal gradient descent, we normally use we normally use the value of alpha equals 0 0.001. You can you can play around with the value of alpha to see how the algorithm works. Now I said that we need to initialize the weights randomly and not equal to zero. The reason we do so is to break the symmetry. If all neurons start from the same point then there will be no diversity in the features they receive. All neurons at the first layer will learn pretty much the same features from the data set. So essentially we learn the same features again and again in different neurons. Hence we initialize it randomly. But how do we do that? By just using random numbers we will generate any number and we want weights in a specific range so that our convergence is easier. There are many ways to do so. We will see them in our project of creating ANN from scratch. Now, gradient descent may not always give you an optimal solution. It, it depends on from where you start. So, you need to perform many experiments to see which random value or which random initialization gives you the best result. So, suppose if this is our plane where this these two parameters theta 0 and theta 1 are your weights and j theta 0 theta 1 is the cost or the error function. Now if you start from over here and you move down here then you will reach over here. But if you start from this point and you take small steps for the, equal to the learning rate and you will reach over here. This has lower value than this. Then this is our correct solution but still we reach over here. But what if we started from somewhere over here, then we may never need reach over here. Instead, we will reach to this region, which, which is much greater than these regions. So, gradient descent, if not initialized properly, gradient descent may lead you to the local minima and not the global minima. In the next video, we will talk about building, a, building ANN from scratch in Google Collaboratory. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome. In this video, we will see what do we need to do in order to build a neural network from scratch. So the building blocks of a neural network are the layers which consists of neurons, a forward pass, backward pass, storing the gradients, passing the right gradients to the right neurons and updating the parameters. There is also, there is also there is also a step of calculating the cost, but we have included that in forward pass. 
Firstly, let's see how these steps are performed in Python. For a forward pass, the computation includes computing Z, that is wait, waits time activation from previous layer plus the bias. For each layer, there is only one bias term. And then we pass this Z to calculate activation for the current layer. To implement this, we use dot function from numpy. The shape of our weights and activations of previous layer are compatible for dot product. Then w dot x plus b is passed to the function defined by us in python that implements the particular activation function. For backward propagation, the computing includes of com for backward propagation, computation includes computing of gradients dz l, dz for lth layer, dw for lth layer, and db for lth layer, which means derivative of j theta with respect to z l, derivative of j theta with respect to w l, and derivative of dj theta with respect to dbl. dj theta upon dwl and dj theta upon dbl respectively. Suppose we have only two trainable layers. The gradient for the last layer will be given by dz2 equals a2 minus y. a2 is the activation of the last layer minus the correct layer, correct label. Then our derivative with respect to weight will of the first layer will be equal to 1 by m because m is the number of uh, examples. If there are m training examples, then the mean of gradients will be taken. For example, this over here dw1 equals to 1 by m dz2 a1. For implementation in python, we use dz2 is equal to a2 minus y. If these two are numpy arrays, then python will handle element y subtraction. For dw2, 1 by m, which is mean of np dot, again the dot product of dz2 and a1 because we have set the weights, set the dimensions in such a way that the dimensions are compatible for dot product. For db2, we just simply add them all in of the axis 1, keep dims is equals to true means that the array, that, that even if we get a single digit, it will be of form in form of an array, something like this. Suppose we get the sum to be 5, then it will be an array of 1 cross 1. Now we need information from the previous layers to be passed to the next layer. And information from the next layers to be passed from to the previous layer. We to do this, we perform caching. For any lth layer, we supply it with activation from the previous layer. The lth layer already knows its parameters and produces zl and activation for the that layer. In backdrop, we pa pass da from the previous layer or the next layer as we are moving backwards. The layer calculates its dw, db and dz gradients along with da which is passed to the next or the previous layer. Now without knowing z, we cannot compute the following. So we store z w d b in a variable cache as tuple for each layer. In this way, each layer gets what it needs. The bottom line of this discussion is that in order to train our network, we need a cache that stores values from certain layers. We implement this using dictionaries in Python. 
This is an organized way of implementing this and this will not bottleneck our algorithm. We use dictionaries because accessing any variable is easy and, ac and the access time is almost constant on average. Choosing the right initial values of our weights will help us speed up the convergence. Increases and it also increases the odd of gradient descent converging to a lower training or generalization error. The general methodology of training a neural network is to first, first initialize the parameters or, and define the hyperparameters. The only hyperparameters for now that you know of are the number of iterations, that is the number of times the gradient descent will be performed on your neural network and the learning rate. Then, after initializing the parameters and the hyperparameters, we, we start the loop. In that loop, we firstly perform a forward propagation. Then, we compute the cost. After that, we perform a backward propagation, computing the gradients, and then we update our parameters using, those parame using the parameters that we want to update and the gradients from the back propagation. After the loop terminates, we use the trained parameters to predict labels. In the next video, we will see the walkthrough of the code in which you will be building a deep neural network from scratch. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome. In this video, we will see how to create a deep neural network from scratch. So, to make you familiar with the environment we are working in, let's take a quick look. This is a cell in Google Collaboratory. It is free to use. You can uh, run the command question mark question mark and a uh, function to know about it. To run a cell, you just need to hit shift and then enter. The cell will run and uh, the help or the documentation that is related to that function will appear on the right hand of your screen. Now, you can also run com Linux commands like uh, print pwd this will print the present working directory you can also use commands like echo hello so in this way you can use bash commands over here you can also use pip and uh, other you can also use pip in order you can also pip if you want to install any library that is not installed uh, in the environment. Although most of the important libraries have already been installed uh, in the Google Collaboratory, you don't need to install them, but just in case I wanted to use, um, let's say I want to install the weights and biases API, then I'll just need to run pip install 1b and uh, this should pretty much do everything. In this way, you can run uh, many other commands from the bash. Now, coming to the project, first let's see what are the important, what are the libraries that we'll be using. We will use NumPy and we import it as NP for the linear algebra part. We will use H5PY because our data set is in the form of H5PY. We will use matplotlib. matplotlib.pyplot to plot our uh, graphs. Uh, how did we do? With the gradient with the functions so that we can visualize our progress we will use scipy to we will use scipy to manipulate the size of our images and we will use pillow if we want to print any image or display any image let's run that then uh, there is this section of helper functions we'll come to that later but uh, let's first see the updation part the update parameter function takes parameters, gradients and the learning rate alpha as input and uh, perform the gradient descent. So parameters, grads, are these two are Python dictionaries and uh, they can be easily used to extra access the variables. So if we want to access w of L lth layer, so for 0th layer it's uh, 1, 0. So for first layer it should be l plus 1 right so l plus 1 and the parameters will be and uh, the updation says 
W is equal to W minus alpha times the gradient TW. So in this way, we update our parameters for uh, every L, for every layer in uh, the range L, where L is the total number of layers. See, uh, the, uh, note how we uh, calculated the total number of layers by length of parameters by two, because each layer has two parameters, the weight and the bias. So in this way, we calculated L from here. This returns the updated parameters. Let's run that and yes, for resizing, there's this helper function load data, which loads the data from our H5PY file in form of, which is in which the images are stored along with labels. So using the load function, we have loaded our original train X or train Y, original test X and original test Y, also the classes. So now we have loaded our data. Let's visualize this. Uh, what do we have in the data? So apparently, so the data contains of uh, two classes, uh, cats and non cats. So there will be two types of images. Uh, one will have a cat and one that will not have a cat. So if we print the 10th uh, example, it will, it is, uh, it is a non cat picture. And uh, let's say if I take 11th, then uh, it's a cat picture. So you can change the index over here and see and walk around to see what kind of images. Do. Now we have loaded our data and images in the data set belong to two classes, either a cat or a non cat image. So let's visualize them by just plotting them using matplotlib and index is the num which example. So if I run this cell, I see a non cat picture. This is a bird. And uh, suppose if I change the index to 11 and I run the cell, then this is a, this is image of a cat. These are 64 by 64 cross images. And uh, since this is an color image, this is a, a third, it has three channels RGB. The train set is like M cross number of pixels cross number of pixels. Now, and uh, for the test set, we have, a uh, we are, we have the same shape, but the number of examples are different for the test set. So we flatten these. So we flatten or reshape our original data set in the form such so that it can be fed to the neural architecture that we will be designing. So the images are stored in form of image height cross image width cross the number of channels for a RVG image or a colored image. It is a three channel image. So we flatten them out so that it can be fed to our single dimensional uh, neural architecture. Then we standardize the data by dividing it by 255. So the essentially the values, the pixel values range from 0 to 255. So if we want our value to be from between 0 to 1, we divide it by 255. So in order to, uh, in order to run this cell, you first need to run the load data function, which is over here. Now, uh, let us define the dimensions of our model. So this is equal to one, two, two, eight, eight, essentially, because that is the number of uh, pixels that will be present in our, in our, uh, in a single image. So each pixel is a feature. So we have said to that, please don't change this. Instead, uh, you can uh, change these three layers. So this is the input layer. This over here is the first layer with 13 neurons. Uh, this is the second layer with seven. This is the second, uh, third layer with fifth. And this is the output layer with only one neuron. And uh, a note, Deeper the network, the more robust it is, but uh, unless and until you have enough data, training deeper neural networks won't hurt the accuracy. Now let's uh, implement the complete L layered model. So first we define the random seed uh, so that we fix our so that we fix the weights every time they are initialized, it doesn't change. 
then we define the co this this will keep track of the costs that are uh, being calculated so that we can later plot and see how we have done then we initialize the parameters using this function initialize parameters uh, and we pass it with layer dims the array or the list that has our dimensions of the neural network so let's see how initialization of the deep networks are performed we will head towards the we will head towards initializing the parameters randomly as well as normalizing them so in this section you can see uh, we again put a random seed here and we define the dictionary parameters as you know l stands for the total number of layers total number of layers in a network then from 1 to l we define all the weights randomly and the shape of the layer should be l comma l minus 1 so number of neurons in the l minus 1th layer and the number of neurons in lth layer or the current layer divided by np dot square root uh, layer dims minus 1 so this is essentially just uh, normalizing so that we don't get very large values and for the biases we initialize it with zeros and they are of the shape uh, of the number of neurons in the current layer comma 1 right so in here we assert and make sure that our dimensions are correct so that in future if we so that uh, when while performing forward pass we do not find any error regarding the dimensions of the matrices or the weights now uh, then uh, we want to then after initializing the parameters we we iterate for the number of iterations and then we perform a forward pass over x is the where x is the input features comma the parameters now uh, if we head to the l model forward part forward pass for the layers l layers so here you can see we have this cache variable which which essentially stores uh, everything that is being calculated and that will be needed in the future layers so we for initialize a with uh, input features and then we calculate the total number of layers by the parameters by dividing by 2 as explained earlier and then we create a proxy for a in a previous and then we calculate the activation for the next layer and uh, cache using the linear activation forward function we pass it with uh, the previous uh, activation of the previous layer parameters of the current layer uh, and the biases and the activation that we want to use we want to use we will be using relu for every internal uh, layer and only for the last layer we will be using the sigmoid function now let's see how linear activation forward is performed so linear activation forward uh, takes input the activation from the previous layer weights biases and the activation function that you want to use so if the activation is sigmoid then we uh, then a linear forward is performed uh, linear forward is performed over uh, activation from the previous layer uh, w and using w and b then we store these in cache in linear cache and uh, in z we store uh, the np dot w np dot w comma x plus b and then we perform the activation part over here so this stores the activation cache uh, to see how linear forward or the single layer is performed you can see it over here we have designed it in a very modular way so that if you want to see how will this uh, neural network work without activation you can just use simple linear forward instead of uh, performing the cache uh, sigmoid part so if here we just simply w you can use np dot w comma a or w dot a uh, it is pretty much the same thing and then add it with the, add the bias this is our uh, hypothesis and then we make sure the shape remains same it doesn't change and then we store it in the cache and return z along with cache this cache is stored in linear cache and then as well as z and uh, for the activation part here we have implemented sigmoid and relu function in uh, using numpy and um, here is the derivative functions relu backward and sigmoid backward these two are the derivatives of uh, relu and sigmoid functions now back to our uh, forward pass for l layers after performing a linear activation for 
forward we get it in the cache and we append it in our caches uh, variable which essentially holds all the caches all the cache from uh, every layer now for the last layer we perform the sigmoid part and we append that as well in the cache then we make sure the shape is correct and then we return the activation of the last layer as well as the caches now we have performed a single forward pass now we need to compute the cost function so cost is equal to compute cost with uh, activation of the last layer al and uh, correct label y so compute cost the compute cost is implemented over here so it's essentially y dot shape uh, we take the number of training examples using y dot shape uh, and then we compute the cost as 1 by m into uh, y into log al minus np.1 minus x into y into 1 minus al. And then we squeeze the cost to make sure uh, it is a real number. Instead of getting something like this in an array format, we get it in form of integer or um, float. We also make sure using the assert function and we return the cost. For the now after we have computed we compute uh, computed the cost we compute the back we compute the gradient using back propagation uh, for back propagation we have used the function l model backward so mm, so there is the, this function uh, l model backward implements back propagation for uh, all l layers uh, here is a uh, grads dictionary and we have calculated L using the length of the caches. Uh, so the L model backward function you, uh, takes input the activation of the last layer, the correct label Y, and the caches, uh, or which essentially contains all the cache from previous layers. Then we uh, then we calculate M uh, number of training examples, and uh, we reshape y in the shape of a uh, activation of the last layer so that it is easier for us to implement it and then we calculate dal uh, which is essentially y upon uh, al minus uh, 1 minus y upon 1 minus al uh, its whole negative uh, we derived this in our previous lectures then we uh, we extract the current cache using l minus 1 then we use linear activation backward function which uh, takes the uh, dal uh, current cache and activation which was used for the last layer for the, that layer and uh, we used sigmoid for the last layer so we pass over here sigmoid and then the gradients da for the l minus 1 layer dw for lth layer and uh, db for the lth layer are calculated so let's jump to linear activation backward function you can also use the question mark feature that I told you about. You can just write a linear linear activation backward to see the documentation. So here is the documentation and the code inside it, uh, what it is doing. You can use a single question mark to see just the documentation part. And you can use uh, two question marks to see the code as well. So uh, you don't have to jump every time. You can use uh, this feature of uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So, so uh, we use uh, we have used the linear activation backward with uh, providing the by providing the uh, parameter activation as with sigmoid and calculated the gradients for the last layers but for the other layer it is quite simple uh, it is it is done in the same way and we instead we use we provide the relu activation and the respective gradients for linear activation backward uh, if we wanted to see how linear activation backward is implemented right so uh, you will just run this cell which uh, now linear activation backward uh, is using uh, takes input the da the cache and the activation uh, linear cache and activation cache are extracted from the cache and uh, they are used for the relu backward part uh, we are calculating the activation backward 
for the relu backward part we are calculating the derivative of the activation function so we pass the activation cache cache and for the linear backward part we are implementing the linear derivative we are calculating the linear derivative so we pass the linear cache so uh, let's just see uh, what uh, what these two function uh, linear backward is doing so this is the documentation of the linear backward uh, in this we cal uh, dz and cache as pass uh, note this cache is a linear cache and uh, then using the linear from this linear cache we uh, extract the weight bias and the uh, activation from the previous layer we calculate the number of uh, examples from the shape of the previous layer and then we calculate dw db and da of the previous using the formulas we also make sure uh, that the shapes are in order so that we don't run into problems later on now we have implemented uh, the back propagation and we have our gradients for all the layers after that we update our parameters using the parameters gradients and the learning rate you can play around with the learning rate uh, i have kept it default to 0.70 in this part we we print uh, the cost at every 100 training example and uh, we add that cost every 100th cost to the cost array then we use uh, plt.pyplot to uh, plot the costs uh, by cost plot the cost in the y axis and uh, iterations per 100 in the x label and then we just title it with the learning rate of the learning rate so this is a uh, this is the heart of our uh, model here we uh, train this returns the parameters so you can store them and retrain it if you want to then parameters is equal to l layer model train dot we pass the train that we loaded we pass the uh, y train that we loaded the dimension of the layers the number of iterations and the and the part that where you want to print the cost or not uh, now uh, we will just hit uh, shift enter to train our uh, example so this uh, should take a while and will be done in a few more minutes or I think uh, 20 30 seconds uh, it shouldn't take more than that I, I will just uh, stop pause the recording and uh, resume when it's done so uh, we are done with the um, training part and we have trained for a thousand iterations and we have printed the cost till uh, 900 and this is how our cost uh, reduced so now let's just now let's uh, predict how did we do with our training example so since we uh, showed our model the training example the accuracy is obviously pretty pretty high it is uh, pretty good with the training example but uh, how about uh, the test cases that we have uh, kept with ourselves so this is uh, 0 0.8 uh, it is quite clear that the model over here has overfitted overfit means it has learned everything from the training set but it, it did not learn it so well that uh, it can perform good on a test set which means our model has not generalized yet so in the next module we will see how do we avoid overfitting using l2 regularize, regularization and dropouts you can also use this uh, code that we wrote for uh, testing the custom images for if a given picture is cat or not for the predict part uh, you can run again question mark question mark predict and this should give you the documentation it just uses the uh, l for uh, l forward pass to calculate the parameters and uh, simply predict uh, checks if uh, the, they match and uh, if they match it's just simply sum it by m that's it in the next video, we will train a neural network in the TensorFlow framework on Fashion MNIST dataset which has 10 categories of images, that is 10 classes as the output. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome back. In the previous videos, you saw how to build a DNN from scratch, but that was too complex and too much code to write every time you have to train a neural network. In this video, we will learn to use TensorFlow 2 to train neural network on MNIST dataset. In fact, 
we will be using the Keras API from TensorFlow. Let's start by importing TensorFlow STF. We will be also importing NumPy and Matplotlib. TensorFlow and other libraries are already installed on the Collab server. So you don't have to install them separately. We will also print the version of the TensorFlow that we will be using. It is supposed to be greater than 2. If in any case, your TensorFlow version is less than 2, just run this cell over here. Now we will load our Fashion MNIST dataset from tf.keras datasets. Uh, we will store the instance of the dataset in MNIST fashion. And then we will use the load function to load the data from this instance. This function returns four NumPy arrays. The images in these NumPy arrays are of 28 cross 28. They are divided into train image and train labels, test image and test labels. Value of the pixel in the NumPy array range from 0 to 255 and the labels range from 0 to 9. That is, there are 10 classes. Here is the map from the label to the class. Each image is mapped to a single label. Since the class names are not included in with the data set, we store them here to use for later plotting images. This class names is a list which has the names of all the classes. At index 0, we have t-shirt top with label and the index will serve the purpose of label. Now we will explore our data set. We will be printing the shape of the training images using train image dot shape. We will be also printing the length of the labels. This will tell us how many training examples we have. We will print the train labels, what all labels we have. We will, we will also print the shape of the test images along with the test labels to see how many examples we have in the test label. So the shape of the training data is 60,000 by 28 by 28 which means we have 60,000 images with uh, the shape of 28 cross 28 and the number of labels is 60,000. So that means again the 60,000 and the labels are 9, 0 like that. Note these are not part encoded. Instead, we are using labels or integers to represent the class. The shape of the test data set is 10,000 cross 28 cross 28, which means we have 10,000 test images of the same shape as that of the training images. Here the train test split is of uh, 6 is to 1. Now we will visualize the data using matplotlib. Here is some plotting code that will help us to visualize our data. I am printing the image at index 0. That is our first image. And uh, this looks like an ankle boot. If I change the index to say 25, then this is a dress which is apparently a top or a t-shirt or a kurti. Now we will normalize our data set. We will normalize our data or the uh, images to range from the value 0 to 1. As the value range from 0 to 255, we will divide it by 255 to get our ranges. Now we have normalized our data. Now let's plot it again. This plotting code helps you to plot Five images, 25 images in a 5 cross 5 grid. So we have plotted 5 images. You can change the, you can change which images to plot by changing the value of this over here. This 50 over here. I have used 50. So this is the 50th example and this is your 75th example. Coming to the model part, we will design a neural network in TensorFlow using the sequential API. What is sequential API? We'll know about, uh, we will get to that in a second. But first, let's see what will be the architecture. So the num input layer will be of 28 cross 28. That is 76 features corresponding to each pixel in our 28 cross 28 images. We will use a, a flatten layer to convert this 28 cross 28 images to a 1D layer uh, in a single vector, and then we will use dense layers. These dense layers are the layers which get trained and uh, its weights are the ones that are optimized during the optimization part. Over here, we are using TF, from tf.keras, uh, we use sequential API. So sequential API essentially groups the linear stack of the layers 
into a tf dot keras model means that is a tensorflow model this so it gen generally stacks these layers it will stack the flatten layer over dense and then over another dense over another dense in this way you will be able to create a neural network with the input layer of uh, 28 cross 28 and then flattened so this will be 786 and uh, on the next layer we will be having 64 neurons in the next layer and the activation will be applied of that rel that of the relu in the next layer we will be having 28 neurons and again the activation of relu and in the last layer we will be having 10 neurons corresponding to the 10 classes and our activation will be softmax because softmax can be used for multi class classification now let's just run this cell now let's look at tf.keras.sequential uh, using the help option in our google collab so sequential group selenius stack of the layers into a tf.keras model sequential provides a training and inference features on this model so it essentially helps you to create stack of layers there are uh, other methods to use this you can either use this method which is says tf uh, you initialize the model with the sequential and then use model dot add uh, to add layers after the, uh, this is helpful if we if you want to add layers to the, your model afterwards then there is this method by creating an a list of the layers you can create a model using sequential api now uh, let's take a look at the flatten layer so the flatten layer essentially flattens the input it does not affect with the batch size you don't have to worry about the batch size uh, you will know about that when we will see other optimization algorithms in the module 2 so basically this converts a 2d layer into a 1d layer or a, a vector of layers now let's take a look at the dense layer so the doc strings is just your regular densely connected NN layer. Dense implements the operation of output is equal to activation dot input kernel plus bias. So kernel is your weights. Its uh, weights are also known as kernel. So this is your w dot x plus b over the activation, and that is your output of every dense layer. So this is essentially what we did uh, by while implementing it in the scratch and uh, whatever activation you provide here the dense layer applies that activation function coming to the optimizer from keras.optimizers we use sgd sgd stands for stochastic gradient descent on default if the learning rate is 0 0.01 and other uh, parameters are not changed then this is essentially a classical gradient descent we will look at the doc string and it will be uh, clear so we create an optimizer by just changing the learn uh, by using tf.keras.optimizers now let's look at the doc string of uh, keras.optimizer.sgd so gradient descent with momentum optimizer so the update rule of w with gradient g when momentum is zero so by default momentum is zero you don't have to change it for now because we haven't reach the point where we need to deal with momentum so so the update rule for the parameter w with gradient g when the momentum is zero is w is equal to w minus learning rate into g which is essentially w is equal theta is equal to theta minus alpha times uh, delta g delta w so that is the updation or the classical gradient descent that we used now let's compile our model with optimizer as uh, this as our optimizer with learning rate 0 0.01 and the loss function as sparse categorical loss now this sparse categorical loss is same as categorical cross entropy but to use cro categorical cross entropy our classes should be one hot encoded that is uh, there will be n layers uh, there will be a column of n classes so if the value if the image correspond it belongs to a class then that particular cell will have the value 1 and the rest of the columns will have the value 0 it will be quite clear when you will see the doc string let's compile this code first so now we have compiled our uh, model 
so this model has been compiled note that it hasn't been trained it has been just compiled we have created the structure and um, the and the random initialization has also happened now let's uh, use the doc uh, help function again help help utility again now the computes the cross entropy loss between the labels and predictions use this cross entropy function when there are two or more labor class label classes we expect label classes to be provided as integers right so we have our label classes here as integers you can see over here they are these are in form of integers and they are not one hot encoded so hence we use our uh, sparse categorical entropy instead of simple categorical cross entropy fun loss function now uh, here is model dot fit so we have created our model using model dot compile and now we will fit the parameters so we provided with train images that will be looking at on the train labels which are the true labels so here epoch is equal to how many times do you want your model to look at those images and uh, learn them now this model dot fit returns a history variable which records everything uh, that your model has went through uh, for example what was the loss and what was the accuracy at a certain point we can also run the help command to see what is going on with model dot fit so uh, model dot fit trains the model for a fixed number of epochs iterations on a data set so here epochs is the iteration on the data set come on the data set now we are using here only 10 because our data set is very small uh, you might think that 60000 images is not small but uh, actually in deep learning it is quite small uh, given that our each image is only of 28 cross 28 pixels so what it returns is uh, is a history object its history dot history attribute is a record of training loss values and metric values at successive epochs as well as validation loss values and validation metrics if applicable so we haven't provided it with any validation data so there will not be any validation metrics let's just fit our model to the training images this will take only a while uh, as we are we have very small images and very small architecture so i'll just pause the video and uh, return when it's done now we are done with the training uh, we have reached the 10th epoch and uh, we have a training accuracy of 87.46 uh, percent which is not bad now let's evaluate our model we saw that in our previous attempt to train we reached the accuracy of 99.99 uh, percent .99%, but our validation uh, but when we tested it uh, on our test data we found that it was overfitting that means we did not generalize well and we had the accuracy of uh, around 86 or 87 percent now uh, let's test this model and see how did this perform so we are using model dot evaluate let us first see the doc string of model dot evaluate using our help command so model dot evaluate returns the loss and matrix values for a model in test mode so it does not train or it does not changes the gradients it just it's just that it will test these test images and uh, using the test labels it will compare the predictions and we will see and it returns the test lost and test accuracy we will just print the test accuracy because uh, that may that will make more sense to us rather than the test loss so we had an accuracy of uh, 86 percent which is quite good uh, quite close to the training accuracy as well so we did clearly did not overfit over here also uh, it is not necessary that uh, after every epoch your uh, training accuracy increases like uh, you can see here we had the training accuracy of 86.40 and in the next epoch we had the training accuracy of 86.27 this is because the model learns new things when it comes to uh, new epochs so it learned something new but it did not fit well it thought it learned something new but it did not fit well in this scenario but then again it improvised and it 
reached the accuracy of 87.202. So to see if your model is working fine, you should look at the loss function. The loss should reduce, right? Because what our aim in gradient descent was to reduce them or minimize the loss function and not to increase the accuracy. So as you can see here, our loss function reduced every time. So that means we are doing well. There are no bugs in our code. Now uh, let's look at the history dot history keys. Let me just close this. Yeah. Now let's look at uh, what are the keys in the history variable that we have received from our model dot fit function. Let's run the cell. So we have a dictionary keys of loss and accuracy. History dot history is just a diction is essentially a dictionary that has two keys loss and accuracy during the training of the model. We will use them uh, soon. So what if we wanted to predict what a test image is? Uh, so using the model. So we'll use model dot predict test images. We'll provide all the test images over here. So I'm just uh, send, providing it with the test images we had from the earlier. If you are providing a custom image, then please make sure that you reshape it to 28 cross 28 cross one dimensional image. Now let's um, make predictions and we will print the first prediction that is uh, the zeroth prediction. So let's run it. And we see a lot of numbers over here. So what does this mean? So this is the probability. What is the probability of that class to happen? So we have something here in 10 to the power minus five, uh, some probability over here 10 to the power minus six, some probability over here in 10 to the power minus two, and then some probability over here 10 to the power minus one. So this is, has the highest uh, probability. So probably the prediction zero is of class ninth, belongs to the class ninth. So if we want to see actually what uh, the class it belongs to in this case, so we will use np.argmax which returns the index of the maximum value. So if we provide it with predictions zero and run the cell, then we should get nine. Yeah, so ninth index has the maximum value. So np.argmax returns the max index of the maximum value. And what did we have in our test labels? We had it zero as well. So our prediction works pretty much good. So as we saw, it is 86% accurate. Now let's plot the values that we received in history. Now we use matplotlib to plot these. Now we use matplotlib to plot the history variables or the or the values we had in our history dictionary. We'll just run this code and you see as we proceeded in the epochs, at first the accuracy was almost zero. We do not see here, but it was zero. <clears throat> Even with random initialization, we did pretty well. But uh, as to after the first epoch, this is approximately the first epoch, we did pretty good and we had an accuracy of 80, around 82%. And then we slowly increased to 86%, 86.7%. Now for the loss, the, at first the loss was uh, quite high so at before zero it was like around zero it was infinity and then after that we significantly reduced the loss as we proceeded in the POC. So that's it you have completed your module one and now you can proceed with the module two in which we will be discussing how to improve a model and uh, how to how to diagnose a model? What are the errors that you should remove and how will you diagnose an error? How to improve the accuracy and uh, how we will also see various types of optimization algorithms. Thank you for watching. See you in the next module.